And we are on item, well, looking at the consent agenda. Do we need to deal with, oh, deal with anything separately? Councillor Desai. Thank you, Mr. Warden. I do have a couple of questions uh, with regards to the letter from Minister Steve Clark, um, uh, with regards to a few items that he has mentioned in the letter. Thank you. And I'm looking for a motion to approve the consent agenda. Moved by Councillor Burley, seconded by Councillor Desai. All those in favor? Any opposed? That is carried, thank you. <coughs> <coughs> Item 6A, Kevin will be on deck, looking at the uh, corporate financial update and year-end projection as of September 30th, 2019. I'm looking for a mover to put the item on the floor, moved by Councillor Keaveney, seconded by Councillor Patterson. Kevin, you have the floor. Thank you, Warden. Uh, um, if Council um, is okay, I'm just going to kind of walk through the highlights of this report and uh, they can ask questions at any time. Um, so the uh, third quarter of financial update here is in front of you and uh, staff have taken that at, as of the end of September and, and then projected expenditures and revenues yet to occur and, and, uh, and, and put, we put that into this um, projection of a year end. Um, so as a summary, the projected year-end surplus, is, we're projecting a $1,415,000 surplus. Um, note, this surplus does not incorporate uh, $92,300 in additional funding received specifically to cover cannabis legalization, nor the one-time um, modernization payment of $725,000 that we received. Um, I'm interpreting those that they both have to be spent on um, uh, projects that the government has identified and therefore I'm, I'm saying they just can't fall in to cover deficits um, or, or to surplus to be used in, in, in a fashion that they're not, they were not provided for. Um, the surplus also includes uh, um, just $1,009,500 in, in net admitted supplementary assessment. Uh, so what I mean by Net is um, we get supplementary or remitted supplementary assessments that we earn, but we also learn of tax uh, write-offs or vacancies, rebates that are approved, and uh, we have appeals that get take many years to go through the system, and, and those those occur, and then those cause write-offs. So, but the net amount there we're, we're predicting is just over a million dollars in surplus from that. And that is a benefit largely to the town of Blue Mountain. So. Um, We've, um, we've heard the councillors from that speak of that, so that, that's helping. <clears throat> um, so I'll start with highlights uh, administration. Uh, positive variance here, about $429,000. Um, we've had staff vacancies, about $92,000, which is um, delaying and hiring a financial analyst. Uh, a min assistant in the finance department retired, and we're, we're we're recruiting that position as a finance officer, which so we had to do a new job description change and work that through. Health and safety manager was seconded to the provincial offenses, so that uh, a new position came into the human resources department and and was um, was paid at a different level and and the timing of that. So, investment income is projected about two hundred eighty-five thousand higher than uh, what I had budgeted. A big portion of that, about 100 and, uh, 116,000 of that is the bond market rebounding that we had corporate bonds with LES. Uh, we were, uh, last year when you took the, what we were getting in interest and then looking at the market value in that, it was pretty much a wash, I think if you recall my investment report. So, um, so that's that council. Uh, it, it appears to be on budget at this present time. Information services is uh, anticipated the end, of the end of the year on budget. Weekly indemnity and our workers' compensation, our, our, our self-insured programs. Um, weekly indemnity is looking at a surplus of about $19,000 based on the, the, the number and the length of weekly indemnity claims we have right now. Workers' compensation budget is projecting a year-end deficit of about $202,000. Uh, that's... Um, that even would have been higher without we, we withdrew from the catastrophic loss insurance uh, that uh, council approved earlier. 
So um, um, as of the end of September, we've got health care and loss of earnings and administrative fees associated with these claims, about $472,000. So, so we have had a number of PTSD or traumatic mental stress claims, and those have been ongoing, some of them. But I have to say we have fewer claims in 2019, so we're hoping um, with, with what Kevin and, and the paramedics have done with that peer support, initiative the council approved that those are having positive impacts on that number but it's too early to tell or it could be just good luck I, I, I'm not sure but anyway um, if uh, if needed uh, if we do have a shortfall overall it, it, for uses of the surplus and we had to come back there is a WSIB reserve of when we're self-funding that we could access our assessment cost impact that's uh, well in the budget in the year on budget <clears throat> POA, we're projecting a deficit of about $30,000 after cost sharing with Bruce County. Gross revenues at the end of September are actually $53,000 higher. Um, but based on comparisons for the fourth quarter when our ticket volumes drops, uh, uh, we, we feel we're going to end up with a shortfall here in our revenues. So, um, But ticket volumes are difficult to, to um, predict, I guess. Health unit and other funding initiatives um, projected in the year of the surplus about $189,000. Um, I reported back in uh, earlier on the, after the, f the second quarter that um, was about a $15,000 surplus here. We were um, made aware that the uh, health unit ended the year with a 2018 year with a surplus and they returned to us $173,000, Gray County share of that surplus. So. Um, pro property, and we're projecting to have a balanced position at the end of the year. Um, taxation and our grants budget, this is our, earlier I spoke to that we have the, uh, we're projecting a million dollars, just over a million dollars in omitted and supplementary taxation out of any write-offs. And as well, I spoke to the uh, one-time modernization funding and the, uh, the funding for the uh, um, legalization of marijuana coming on that funding as well I spoke to. Um, planning, uh, anticipate at the end of the year with a small service of about $5,000. Um, savings in the civic addressing budget uh, as, as the printing of a new, back, new map book was less than what had been budgeted. Agriculture projected to the end of the year with a surplus of about $10,000. Um, that's mainly uh, as at the end of September, the Coyote grant and the Beaver grant expenditures being less than what was budgeted. So. Forestry and forestry trails, budget anticipated to have a slight deficit, about approximately 10,000. Um, primary, that's just less revenue from the forest harvest. Um, trails anticipated in the year with a surplus of 40,000. Um, key here is the maintenance of the CP trail, rail trail was initially budgeted at 50,000. It was anticipated the grain and material would be required following the grading of the trail that took place in 2018. However, this additional grain and material material has not been required. Economic development, <clears throat> projecting a year-end operating deficit of about $175,000 and a balanced capital budget. This is the startup year for that community hub, the Sydenham campus, and external scenarios have impacted the, the plan process of securing revenues or tenants, and staff is working with partners and other levels of government to renovate this building improve building systems and introduce programming and secure tenants right now. And, and Savannah has been here and spoken that in the past. So tourism, uh, a year end surplus about 20,000. Um, there was a staff vacancy for a short period of time um, that someone had retired. Um, and then we hired someone and then that person left as well. So um, gray roots anticipating end of, ending the year on budget. Um, their uh, retail sales and their special event emissions are actually surpassed their 2019 ex uh, expectations, uh, but they're being offset by higher maintenance of some equipment and, and what we're seeing in snow removal. Ontario Works uh, projecting year-end surplus about 142000 or $143,000. Um, average monthly caseload is about 1272 for the first nine months compared to a an anticipated caseload of 1,340. Um, what, part of this, this surplus is really being um, 
the government announced this year in 2019 that our, our approved funding was going to be cut and it was being based on our 2018 actuals. So that required um, about 396,000 in overall gross spending that had to be cut. So um, what, what has occurred, there was an, some staff that have, had left and stuff. We've not filled those positions to um, reduce that budgetary shortfall. So, um, so that, and that's what we're anticipating with our 2020 budget is we'll still have to remain at that 2018 funding level for, with the province. Um, child care projecting a year with a surplus about $25,000. Um, again, some savings and positions that weren't filled. Um, there's also there with, uh, we've got funding for expansion and which is provincial funding for child care. And then we have an early, early learning and child care ELCC funding, which again was a federal to help expansion of child care. We're having difficulties really trying to expand the child care programs because of staffing again it's another it seems to be a theme um but so um operators aren't willing really to till they can have the staff they're not willing to undertake this um taking on more um, money and stuff so it's something that staff's working on and they've they're meeting they've had meetings with the the partners the stakeholders the operators and stuff so we'll continue to work on that um it's uh chicken and egg thing, right? You got, I'm sure people want to look and find, find daycare, but we can't, can't find ways to get these open. So, um, housing projecting in the year on budget, um, long-term care portfolio, looking at a deficit about $170,000. Um, parts of that were, uh, we had budgeted like 2% increases ministry funding from various ministry envelopes. Um, we did not receive 2%. Um, we also, our CMI has dropped, um, which is causing problems. We've had overages in staffing costs, um, meaning I mean, you've heard discussions about unfilled shifts that are people canceling at last minute, so other people were being called in and being paid overtime and stuff. So, um, but then also with uh, the end, end of the management contract and uh, other savings, um, we're, um, we are having a net position of about a deficit of 170. I think I projected this higher back in the midterm, and that was at that time the structural compliance and the high wage um, funding was to end in 2019, and the government now has announced that that won't happen until 2020. So that's improved this portfolio somewhat. Um, um, and then transportation services, um, projecting an operating deficit of about 300,000 and about 750,000 capital surplus. Um, they've got over expenditures in pothole patching, brushing and pavement marking, and winter maintenance um, is projected to be over budget. Um, and then on, on the capital side, they've got all seven of their capital projects tendered and are close to completion. and. Uh, and based on that, um, they're rejecting $750,000 uh, surplus there. And I, I think it was Gray Road 40, the Paul Verizon paid job that was your biggest, uh, biggest savings there and come in under. And then uh, paramedic services uh, um, projected the end of the year with a $340,000 operating uh, deficit. Um, part of that was uh, we had anticipated a 1.5% ministry um, Inflationary increase, uh, we didn't get that. Um, we only received uh, 67,000. So that resulted in a, in a shortfall, but just um, over uh, uh, $108,000. Um, there was also some other staffing issues that have gone into, that have occurred in that department. And if, if you want further information on that, you'd have to go into closed session. But um, so overall, the county's departments are projecting a corporate year-end surplus of 1,400,015, $415,000 and I said it again I would just say that doesn't include the 725,000 in revenue we, we received for the moder modernization payment nor the additional $92,300 that we've received for the recreational cannabis legalization so and again a, a big chunk of that that surplus is a million dollars uh, in the omitted supplementary taxation that uh, has primarily come from the town of the Blue Mountains. So I'd try to answer any questions I can, and there's other finance staff here too that 
have worked on these that I can ask for assistance to if I can't help. Um. Councilor Desai. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, one of the questions I have is with regards to the cannabis funding. Um, we do have an organization uh, that we have council members sitting on the Gray Bruce um, um, Al Drug and Alcohol Strategy uh, Group. Um, I was wondering, I, Kev, over lunch, Kevin gave me um, the, the parameters for using that cannabis funding. Uh, funding. And one of the uh, uses for it is to conduct an integrated public awareness campaign to communicate the rules and regulations for recreational cannabis and educate Ontarians about the health and safety measures in place to protect them. Uh, the group that I mentioned, the Community Drug and Alcohol Strategy Group, uh, does um, do a lot of education uh, work um, uh, for, for other uh, uh, substances as well. Uh, and I was wondering if um, maybe there would be support around this council table to uh, look at using some of that fund and uh, funneling it to, the, to this particular group in order to uh, in order to have them promote uh, education around cannabis. So the correspondence that we got from the province in November of 2018 um, spoke to um, some specific things. Municipalities must use this funding to address the costs that directly relate to the legalization of recreational cannabis, enforcement, response to public inquiries, paramedics, fire, bylaw, and policy development. So I'm not sure if the other would qualify for that, but it's certainly something that we could approach the province to ask that question. Go ahead. Um, yeah, the letter, the letter goes on, and, on, and this one talks about campaign so uh, but again it would have to be something we'd run through the province um, for sure I, I did say to Councillor uh, Desai um, we're I, with paramedic services and housing I don't, I don't think we've seen the extent of the impact of this yet I'm, I'm, what I mean by that is um, I'm not sure what's going to happen in our housing units once plants start being grown there and all the other issues that might come along with that and things like that so I guess that way we were kind of a wait and see to see where the need for this funding was, but um, anyway. I can also speak to um, the county is working and our, our uh, director of legal services is actually working right now on the development of a new uh, smoke-free bylaw in accordance with the new regulations and legislation coming out. So that will also require some new signage. Um, around all of the county properties. And I know when we implemented the smoke-free bylaw for Gray County several years ago, we worked with the health unit and provided signage to our local municipalities as well. So there will be a cost associated with, with that once it's implemented. Councillor McQueen. I think, uh, Madam Clerk, that was a lot to do with the nine meter rule too. Right. Um, just a couple comments and maybe back to uh, Sue Patterson with regards to the Grey Bruce Health Unit in the sense of their publication and that we don't have a store yet, right? There's no store. So it's not really immediate into our area. But I understand that there's, from what I'm gathering, the edible side is going to be a whole new ball game. And if there's no limitation on that, maybe we just hold off and work with the Grey Bruce Health Unit. But I understand the edible side is, is, is something that maybe we want to, and, and if there's a store, and I don't know what's the, anybody can tell me with the, the, the layout of more bricks and mortar. I know they, they originally was at 50 stores, and then now there were other provinces that are just all out there, right? So, um, and I think if you listen to the business report, uh, I think there's a real disappointment on the business side of cannabis where it just didn't take off like I think they thought it was. So 
maybe we got a real bonus when we got this money because uh, obviously maybe from the provincial government, they didn't get the revenues even to support us getting this money, right? But I would just suggest maybe we just hold off and wait. Thank you. Just so in the sense of on the edible side and see what, what rolls, what, what happens there, but just a thought. Councillor Mackey. Thanks, Warden. Um, I agree with Councillor Desai's comments around the, the drug and alcohol strategy working group. They leverage the dollars very well with all the, uh, the free labor they get from the member uh, agencies, social service agencies uh, throughout Graham Bruce County. Maybe we can bring it back uh, to our uh, drug and alcohol group to develop a bit of a business case for how that money would be spent and present that back to Council. Councillor Bartnicki. I'm in favor of investigating a little further uh, to see what the ministry is saying, what our drug and alcohol um, agencies are saying, and also where those stores have already been legalized. We could inquire about the impacts uh, that are already happening in those communities to learn in advance what we have to prefer Pre pre prepare for and be proactive about putting things in place instead of reactive. Councillor Silver. Yes, um, you, you did mention that there was um, that our legal department was working on some policy development. Um, are we? in a position to capture that time out of administration and put those costs towards this funding? I would, I would say yes, based on what I've read, that on, the, on the letters I have, that the costs are your bylaw and stuff, right? The uh, <clears throat> examples of permitted costs include bylaw and policy development. For example, police, public health, workplace safety policies. I see no one else, so I will call the question. All those in favor of the motion? Any opposed? Thank you, sir. On deck is Anne-Marie. Uh, we are dealing with Ontario Housing Priorities Initiative funding allocation. I need a mover to put the item on the floor. Moved by Councillor Woodbury and seconded by Councillor O'Leary. Anne-Marie? There we go, good. Um, there's two parts to this uh, report, actually. Uh, first part being that the Ottawa Heights uh, development that we're looking at continuing on, we have an opportunity, um, hopefully, um, to uh, complete the 54 units. Uh, in order to do this, uh, we received some funding through the Ontario Priorities Housing Initiative from the province earlier, and I had brought a report back to council or to council saying um, we were going to take the three years of funding and put it towards the build. Uh, we've been working with the province, and, and they are um, have worked out a. a, a I guess a deal in which we can uh, put all of that funding into this year so that we can better support that build. So it's just a little bit under the $1.5 million uh, and that would go towards developing uh, affordable units for the Ottawa Heights. Uh, in talking with the province, there is some funding uh, remaining at the province left over uh, in the COCHI program, which is the Canada-Ontario Community Housing Initiative. Um, the province has reached out to say they have extra funds uh, that could be used towards this development in order to ensure that we can increase the number of affordable units to make the build worthwhile. Um, our $1.4 million would, would get us approximately about 10 or 11 units out of uh, the 54 that would be affordable. Um, with increased funding, we can hopefully increase that number. Um, optimally, um, Owen Sound Municipal Housing Company was looking at hopefully providing 43 units of affordable housing, and the remaining would be at market. Uh, and I do not have confirmation from the province on an amount, um, but it is time sensitive, and they did ask that I approach council and ask that our uh, transfer payment agreement that we signed originally um, be amended uh, to include extra and new funding. Um, unfortunately, I don't have that amount today. 
but it's a good opportunity for us. Um, it provides um, the ability for the apartment building to be um, completed in one phase um, and also um, provides more uh, affordable units for um, the County of Grey. Questions, anyone? I call the question. All those in favor? Are there any opposed? That is carried. Thank you very much, Anne Marie. Savannah Myers is on deck. We're dealing next with item 6C, leasing at Sydenham campus. I need a mover to put the item on the floor. Moved by Councillor Burley, seconded by Councillor Desai. Savannah, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Warden. Uh, here to talk today about leasing at Sydenham campus. So I brought an update a couple weeks back about where the progress has been made. Uh, but now that we're actually getting ready to start signing leases, we just wanted to provide an update on that specifically. Um, so over the next couple of years, attracting tenants is going to be absolutely key. As you know, in our business plan, we have a six-year plan to be self-sustainable. That only happens if we have tenants in the building. So that is an absolute focus, and Steve Furness has been taking the lead on that. So without him, I would not be here today talking to you about this. Uh, I owe him big time. Uh, and also with the assistance of the Greatman's team because making sure we get these leases right is really important uh, and they help us um, navigate this process because we are not, not uh, equipped to be able to do that on our own. So thank you also to them. So as you know, much of Sydenham campus is going to be leased to partners, uh, organizations, new and scaling businesses to really fulfill that vision and that goal of Sydenham. Uh, it only will be what it is supposed to be when we have the right people under that roof, sharing those resources and that expertise and that passion for business. Uh, so through the business planning process, Jamie Doran provided us a list of tenant criteria because again, we don't want to be in competition with our local landlords. The intent of this is to really get businesses started, make sure they get through that first you know, two or three year period where things can be a little bit iffy and then push them out into the community where those uh, opportunities are available for lease. So we included the tenant criteria in here so you could see what that really looks like. Um, everyone needs to be offering a training of some sort, uh, expertise that are going to advance individuals, employers, and businesses, uh, providing that educational and professional upgrading and certifications, providing learning and work experiences for co-op, uh, apprenticeship, and other students because that is really important. We see this as a pipeline uh, to continue our youth moving through and then staying in the area as part of that retention campaign. We want innovative businesses, businesses that benefit from being in a shared space. Nobody will be able to come into this building, close their door, do their own thing, whatever time they're there, and leave again. It really is an open, shared space where everybody needs to be collaborating and working together and sharing those expertise so that we can advance innovation opportunities here. And then research as well. We see a, a real good potential with research and Georgian College too is starting to take a, a new look at research potential. So there's a nice synergy between the two. Uh, and then everyone needs to be committed to that shared and common vision of Sydenham. So the leases, they're gonna vary greatly by square footage. I mean, it could be a small temporary office desk that is literally like a 10 by 10 square and that's it. And you have no guarantee of getting that two days in a row. It's whatever's available, first come, first serve but it could go up to 10,000 square feet or more of leased space. Uh, and in terms of time, it could be daily, could be weekly, monthly, or it could be multiple years, 10 to 15 years in some cases, as some of the conversations we're having because of the level of renovation that they would require. They're looking for long-term lease potential. So there's only really two um, that would be of that scale that could happen, but we wanna be prepared for them now, so we wanted to bring this report forward. So at the time, we are going from the delegation of duties policy, which allows the warden and clerk to enter into these leases, but we do want to let you know that any lease that we have that is looking at a longer than 10-year period or over $100,000 annually, we will bring a report back to you so that you can take that for consideration before we make any signatures. Uh, so that will happen. And probably the most exciting part about this is that this week our first signed lease is coming in, which is really, really exciting. Uh, so I do want to share uh, who they are with you. You're the, the first to hear. It's uh, Bayshore Physical Therapy. And why are they there? Because they are going to be doing innovative research on cancer treatment rehabilitation. 
nobody else is doing it in the area. They are going to be bringing university students into the area. They're looking at ways to connect with Georgian College and the hospital right down the road because of our location. So they are working with all different tiers of healthcare providers to start this research and to, to offer these specialized services. And we're very excited that, that this gets to be our very first story. So they're starting to move the equipment in. The lease is coming in this week. and. Uh, it fits every one of those application criteria. So each um, individual has to fill out the application, which will be attached to the lease, because we want to bind them to this. When they say, this is what we're going to be doing, and this is why I meet that criteria, it needs to be part of that lease. So that is our first good news story that is hot off the press today. Uh, but we did want to share that and just keep you informed that leases are starting, and anything large scale will be coming back to this table. So thank you. Thank you, Savannah. Are there any questions? That is great news. I want you to know we're really proud of Savannah because uh, she was, everything she learned, she learned in Hanover. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I think we're ready to call the question. <laughs> All those in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. Okay, we're now going to go back and deal with item 5B, the correspondence from the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Did I miss something? No. <laughs> uh, I need, well, we should probably put it on the floor, right? Um, Councilor Desai, will you move putting it on the floor? Seconded by Councilor Mackey. Thank you. I saw him twitch. Councilor Desai. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, one of my first questions on this one is with regards to um, the uh, uh, the suggestion from um, from the minister that they might be looking at aligning the the fiscal years for um, the province and the municipality so that they're um, they're identical. Uh, my question through you to our staff is, um, other than the obvious challenge of will it be three three months of the wild west or a one fifteen month budget on a one off, uh, what what position? Is our staff taking on this? Are they generally supportive of it? Or are they um, wary of it and would advise against it? Um, the second question I had uh, was with regards to the, uh, the voters list. Um, the, the suggestion is that there would be one voters list maintained. Now, the, the way voting works on the municipal level and the provincial level is, is significantly different because municipal voter lists are based on property ownerships and not residents. So how, how would that um, work out, I guess, is, is my question. And um, yeah, thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Warden, with regard to the uh, potential change or alignment of municipal fiscal years. Uh, I don't feel, that, I don't think that as staff we have particularly strong feelings one way or another. I can see um, both benefits as, as well as some challenges with this. Um, we have a lot of procedures, a lot of policies, a lot of agreements that are based on the current calendar year so there would need to be a lot of thought put into making adjustments to those things so that everything aligned cleanly <clears throat> I think um, I know that Kevin raised the point that there would need to be a transition at this so is some year going to be 15 months long um, <laughs> we, we don't know that for sure um, certainly <coughs> we can work with whatever they're doing. As far as the, the benefits go, sometimes we run into challenges just because the difference in fiscal years means that they, they're in a position to announce things or launch things at a time that doesn't seem always to, to align as well with, with our annual cycle. So you get you know things that happen outside of a budget cycle that really it would be nice to have known so that you could put some, some resources towards that. We found ways to, to uh, you know, make that work, but it's more challenging in the, in the smaller municipalities, I think. Um, so I don't know, Kevin, do you have anything more about the fiscal year piece? Just 
just that um, there is not a lot of information on other than this statement, and I'm sure the the associations, the municipal finance officers, and AMCTO and stuff will will play an active role. I'm sure Eamon would too. Um, it would be. I, Kim highlighted too a lot of. I know a lot of our provincial funded programs. Sometimes they drag. It's August or September before we're getting funding announcements cleared up. And you know, on our annual budget, then we're nine months in, and it's hard to to, to, to change things. So I know a number of times the paramedics uh, with the community paramedicine programs, we would be, be sitting out there not knowing what's happening and, and stuff. So I, I guess it's a wait and see and learn what they're thinking. Are, are they phasing it in? You know, like is it a 15 or a month or is it a one year 13, next year 14? I, I don't know. But there'd be software changes and stuff that would have to be looked at and things. But uh, no, it's a good good. Good rate to raise it so everybody's aware that this is something being thought about. Um, I can provide just a very minimal bit of information about the voters list in that I know that the um, AMCTO, so the Associated Municipal Managers, Clerks and Treasurers, is this is something they have been advocating for for probably a decade. So they are very, very happy that this streamlining of the voters list is um, coming into play. They're, they're seeing that as, as quite positive. Councillor Desai. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, with regards to the voters list, why? Um, and again, the question of um, how, do, how do they um, reconcile the fact that municipally, uh, residence is not the only uh, criteria. There's also um, uh, property ownership, regardless of whether you live there or not. Uh, whereas with provincial, residency is the only criteria. How, how do they reconcile that? I know that part of this was the challenge that creating and maintaining a voters list posed to your clerks in your individual municipalities. That this was a, a, a difficult job um, that people weren't always as equipped to deal with as, as you would have hoped. It takes up a significant amount of pe people's time and it felt a little bit like no matter what you did, it was never going to be perfect. And then you hear about it. So I, I know that that was part of the driving force for taking this away from the municipalities because every time there was an election and there was issues with the voters list, it came back to your local municipalities who were really only doing the best that they could with the information that they had. Councilor McQueen. Good, good discussion. I will say that probably from a provincial uh, perspective, they probably, if it is addressed, they have your driver's license, your health card, your hunting card, or whatever other card you have that's registered with the province, they have that by your, by your residence. So they have the advantage over a municipality, where the municipality only is based on property and tenant information, and through impact, they're supposed to collect the tenant information, but if you're a landlord, you're supposed to send in the tenant information. And a lot of times that doesn't happen, and there's a lot, and, and I think from a perspective of tenants, they actually lose out probably the municipal opportunity to vote because they're just not on the list or they just don't realize. But I, I don't know the other thing with provincial, I know federally you get a card in the mail to where you vote. Yeah. I don't know if provincially, uh, I can't remember a year ago last June if, if they got a card, but so then there's sort of that spurring on you got you got to go here to vote, you know, and that kind of stuff where mm -hmm. uh, municipally you just, you see it, you read it in the paper but you don't get anything to say this is where you go to vote right and uh, mind you a lot of municipalities <coughs> have gone to the the uh, internet or other types of voting so you really it's made it easier that way and i don't know if the government's looking at doing that either i guess that's the other side on the flip side is the provincial and federal government looking at alternate ways of voting we'll just leave it at that council bartnicki in our area, and I'm sure in a few others too, um, 40 to 52 percent of our population are part-time uh, residents, and um, they have the right to vote where they uh, rent or own property. So we do have them voting, a lot of them. Um, if we go to a provincial list, I would think they would most likely be voting 
in their primary residence, which is the one usually used on their licenses and those other cards. And that would almost take them out of uh, our local uh, voting process sometimes. So that's a bit of a concern. Um, yeah, it's a little bit of a concern. I'm not sure how that would actually impact uh, municipalities that are, are like us. Okay, we've had a, oh, Councillor Soever. Yes, following up on uh, Councillor Bradnicki's comments, um, according to the census, we had 7,025 people in 2016, and our voters list was 12,066. So on our voters list, if you segregate it by um, resident, non-resident, there's slightly more non-resident addresses. So if they can't vote, the question is, do they still have to pay taxes? Okay, good discussion. I'll call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. We're on to item seven. Is there any other business? delegations council uh, you'll be aware that Roma delegations requests are due on the 2nd of December um, so next meeting on November the 28th um, <coughs> we will be looking to confirm the delegations that we wish to request at Roma in January so I just I leave that with you for you for your thoughts and but we will have a prepared um, list of things as from a staff perspective for your consideration at the next meeting. Councilor McQueen. Just following up from this morning's presentation at our long term care discussion. Are you sending out the that site plan and that information that was presented this morning. I didn't see it. I Sorry, that was provided to the Committee of Management and could be part of the minutes of that, so Tara will make sure it gets posted on the website, okay? Yes, we'll add that as well. Okay, is there any... I think I need to just... okay. There we go. Is there any other other business? Other other? Moving on then, item eight, any notices of motion? Councillor Bartnicki. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, in a nutshell, I'm bringing a notice of motion that is related to the Gray County CIP uh, prioritization of attainable housing and our decision on September 26th at this council uh, to encourage all lower tier municipalities to um, gather their supplementary assessments. So what I would be asking for in this motion, which I have already forwarded to the clerk, is uh, that we have a staff report come to council to look at the impacts of allowing each municipality to keep its supplementary assessment in the year only that it is raised, given that it is outside of the levy and the budget process in that year. So I will uh, bring bring that at the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bartnicki. Are there any other notices of motion? Seeing none then, I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. Councillor Thomas, I see you blinking your eyes, and uh, <laughs> Councillor, <laughs> looking over here, is it Gamble there? Yeah. Yeah? No, no. Oh, he's no. left, okay. No. Councillor Burley. <laughs> Seeing that he's already halfway out of his chair. <laughs> All those in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. Thank you very much. Um, the committee for 